Hello, this is Maria from Four Season Foraging, a Minneapolis-based business that teaches you to safely and sustainably work with wild edibles. And today I'm out to talk to you about wild spring greens. It's nearly May here in Minneapolis and it's the perfect time of year to go out and pick wild spring greens, uh, whether you want them for smoothies or salads or sandwiches or whatever other tasty thing you like them in now is a great time of year to go out and do that i'm gonna go over a few different wild spring greens in this video uh, just quickly go over the identification and harvesting but before i start the video i just want to say thanks for watching i hope you'd like it and if you do please hit the like button subscribe to my channel and ring the bell for notifications it helps me out a lot and if you do have a few extra dollars a month, you can join me on Patreon. The link is in the description box down below. And on there, you can pledge a small monthly dollar amount to help me keep producing these free informative videos for you all. So thanks a lot. So down at my feet here, we have a very common and well-known plant. I'm sure you know what it is. It's dandelion and very well loved too, right? I'm kidding. I know it's not. I know people usually hate it, but I really love dandelion. I think it tastes great and it's also full of lots of awesome vitamins and minerals, which are good for your body. But besides that, the part that you want to eat, well, there's many edible parts. So basically all of it is edible. The root, the leaves, the flower, the flower bud. You can eat it all. I've never eaten the stem of the flower. Um, I have read about people using it kind of like zoodles, you know, like zucchini noodles, but that actually sounds kind of gross to me. I've never tried it though. Maybe it's good. I don't know. So lots of edible parts here. And in spring, of course, is the best time to get the greens. And you want to get them as early as possible before it gets too warm or ideally before the plant flowers. You can see it's flowering here. They do flower very early. And the reason for that is because they do get bitter quite quickly and they have a tendency to toughen up as well as the season goes on. So you can see that these greens here all have kind of a dark green color. So when they're more of a light green or yellowish green, then they tend to be younger, less bitter, and more tender. So that's ideally what you're looking for, but you can definitely still eat them like this. You might want to cook them if it tastes a little bit tough to you. You can just steam them, boil them, saute them. Any way you cook them is fine. Some people like cooking them in a change of water. So you bring some water to a boil, throw the dandelion greens in. Meanwhile, have another pot of water boiling on the side and you strain out the first pot, just take the greens and throw it in the second pot of clean boiling water and that will help get rid of some of the bitterness but unfortunately it also gets rid of all those great vitamins and minerals that I mentioned that are in dandelion. I mean it won't get rid of them completely but it will lessen the amount. I don't personally like doing it that way um, and I don't actually mind the bitterness. I tend to like bitter greens I could go on for a while about all the great things that bitter properties do for your body, but I'll just say that bitterness is lacking in our modern Western diet, and it does actually help with things like digestion and mineral absorption. So it is important to get. The way I usually eat dandelion greens is just raw in a salad or in a pesto blend. You can even blend it into a smoothie, uh, a green smoothie. But usually what I like doing it with it is putting it into a salad. Oh, it's also good in hummus if you like a green hummus. But the bitterness of the greens I feel like mixes really well with like salty and acidic things. At least for me, that's how I like bitter foods. Some people, and you'll find some recipes too that recommend, for example, putting a sweet vinaigrette on or you know, sweetening it in other ways. Maybe adding dried fruit or something like that. That doesn't super appeal to me. It just kind of then tastes bitter and sweet and it's like two opposing flavors combating each other. And I'm not really into that. So usually what I like doing is putting some lemon juice or vinegar or some kind of acidic thing like that on it and putting pl plenty of salt on there, some kind of 
fat source like olive oil is really good. If you're cooking it, then you could use butter or something like that. But for me, having a simple salad with lemon juice and olive oil and salt and dandelion greens and maybe some other mixed greens in there is really delicious. I recommend that you give it a try. If you know that you don't like bitter greens, then probably don't do that. But for me, it's really tasty. And I'll also say about dandelion that it doesn't have any poisonous lookalikes, at least not around here in Minneapolis. There are a lot of plants that look like dandelion, especially before it flowers, because the flower is very distinctive. There's things like evening primrose, wild lettuce, cat's ear. They all look superficially similar to dandelion, especially in the basil rosette stage is what it's called, when it's just the leaves that are in the ground in this circular pattern. But they're all edible, so there's not really a big concern about accidentally eating the wrong thing with dandelion. It's a great plant for beginners. Right next to me here, we have another very common plant. It's called garlic mustard. You might be familiar with it because it's considered an invasive plant in the US, which means that it came from somewhere else. In this case, this is a Eurasian species. I know that covers a huge swath of continent, but it's considered invasive because it will actually take over native forest environments to the point where it's crowding out the native ephemeral plants and the more sensitive species. So this is actually a really good plant to eat for control reasons and just to like pick and pull out wherever you see it because you could pull out a thousand of them and for every thousand you pull up there'll be another thousand that come up. I recommend if you're interested to check out your local nature center and see if they have any garlic mustard poles. Especially if you live in the eastern US or the Midwest, chances are that there will be something like that and you can participate knowing that you're helping the ecosystem. And maybe they'll let you take it home and eat it too. With garlic mustard, it's a little different from most greens. Most spring greens you want to get before the stem goes up or before there's any flower or buds. And with garlic mustard, you actually want to get it when there is a stem. And ideally you want to get it before it flowers. So there's like flower buds at the top here, but they are not open yet. But when they do open, they'll be small white four petaled flowers. So the tastiest part is actually the stem here, as long as it's tender. So the easiest way to tell if it's tender is to snap it like this. And you see how it's just bending? This is not good. <laughs> this just means it's going to be too tough to eat, too fibrous. So maybe there's another one in here that's better. Okay, so this one just snapped right off. Um, okay, now it doesn't want to show, doesn't want me to show you, but it does just snap. I swear it did. See, this one just snapped at the bottom here. I love garlic mustard. It's really good. If you like mustard greens, then you'll like it. It is in the mustard family, which is why it's called garlic mustard. And it also has a slight garlic flavor. So the name makes sense. It's awesome. So yeah, if you like, you know, mustard greens, collard greens, turnip greens, things like that, you'll very likely like garlic mustard. It does develop more of a bitterness. I would say more of a pronounced bitterness than those other greens. But again, if you get the stem at the right stage where it's nice and tender. The stem has a lot less of the bitterness. And the leaves are way more bitter. Whoa, yeah. It was very bitter. As I mentioned with dandelion, I do like bitter greens, so it doesn't actually bother me that much, but for the average person, it'd probably be too bitter. But the stem itself, you can just eat raw, you can chop it up, put it in salads, tacos, whatever. You can steam it kind of like a green bean or a snap pea. And it actually has a flavor similar to snap pea, except a little more bitter and more of that like zingy garlic kind of flavor. So yeah, for most people, the plump tender stem is the best part to eat. And again, you wanna make sure to get it earlier in the season before the flowers are fully out and it should snap readily when you break it off of the plant. If you want to eat the leaves, I do recommend eating them 
I mean, you could just like throw them away or compost them or whatever, but they do make a really delicious pesto. So there's lots of pesto recipes up there, out there on the internets, but basically you just blend it up with some olive oil and Parmesan and some kind of nuts and put it on pasta, put it on a sandwich, it's super tasty. And it's also really good in hummus. If you like a green hummus and with this plant in particular, it adds the zinginess from the garlic flavor. So I think it works really, really well in hummus. And then as for identification, the leaves are scalloped along the edges and they have this, sometimes it's more of a kidney shape, sometimes it's more of a heart shape, but this is the general shape of the leaves. The stalks are somewhat hairy. They have like minute little hairs on them. And when they first come up, they'll be growing in this basil rosette. There's that term again. So just the leaves coming out straight out of the ground in kind of a circular pattern. And then the stem will come out later in the year. Here in Minneapolis, it comes out usually in May. And the flowers usually come out in mid-May around here. And they are small and white and four petaled. And they'll just be in this little cluster at the tip here. So that's how you identify garlic mustard. And like I said, if you want help identifying it or finding it, probably your local nature center can point you right to it because it's basically everywhere. But luckily it's delicious. So this plant on the ground here is daylily and you're probably more familiar with it when its flower comes out. It has an orange six petaled flower. Technically it's three petals and three sepals, but they all look like petals, so it's fine. It has a big, bright, usually orange, six petal flower. There are other hybrids that make yellow flowers or purple or red or whatever, but orange is the one that's definitely safe to eat. There's some controversy with other ones. The flower is edible, the flower bud is edible, but the lesser known edible part is the shoot of the plant. I should also mention that the roots are edible, so the roots grow in these tiny little, they're almost like tiny little potato-like bulbs on a string. And it's usually this like thick cluster of roots. And you can just dig those up and you can eat them raw. Some people do experience allergic reactions or irritation when eating them raw. So cooking them is usually the safer way to go. And the time of year to get those would be now. But this video is about greens. So I'm gonna focus on that. The greens of daylily look like this. And these are still actually quite small. I would want to pick them a little bit bigger because the part that you want to eat is the part inside here. It's the shoot. The shoot of a plant is just like the growth that it sends up in the spring. So like asparagus, for example, we eat the shoots of asparagus. So what you do is you pick it. It's better if you have a knife. I don't have a knife on me, but cut it close to the ground and then peel off the outer layers. And then this like tender, like light green, crunchy part in the middle is what you wanna eat. And you can eat it raw, but usually recommend cooking it. Some people experience allergic reactions or irritations when eating it raw. So it is usually better to cook it first by sauteing it or steaming it or giving it a light boil, but I'll try it just for science, you know? <laughs> and for me, I've eaten lots of daylilies before, both raw and cooked and pickled. And eating it raw, I haven't experienced any big reactions to it. So that's why I feel fine just chomping on it. And by the way, if you're not sure how you react to daylily, just taking a bite and waiting around 24 hours should tell you how you feel. And then you can slowly increase the amount that you eat. As far as identification goes, you do want to make sure you're getting the right thing because iris looks a little bit similar at this stage. Once iris sends up its flower, you will never confuse the two because iris has this, you know, blue, purple, like irregular, unusual and beautiful flower. Whereas, like I said, daylily has this symmetrical six petaled orange flower, typically orange. So you won't confuse it at that point. Also, the roots are different. So daylily has all those bulbs on the rootstock, whereas iris does not have that. It'll just be like 
a mess of little thin roots. Another way to tell them apart at this stage is just by looking at the plant itself. So daylily, you can see it has these drooping leaves. With iris, the leaves will be straight up and they're almost like sword-like in appearance. They'll be straight up and they'll be stiffer. They won't be as uh, floppy or bendy as this. They don't have this like fold in the middle here that you see with daylily. So these are like kind of folded in half with iris, they'll just be straight up and down. So definitely make sure to tell the difference because you don't want to be eating the iris shoot. So that was my video about wild spring greens. I hope that you liked it and learned a thing or two. If you did, please hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, and ring the bell for notifications. It really helps me out a lot. And I would also love for you to join me on Patreon. There's a link down below in the description box. It's a really simple way for you to pledge a small monthly dollar amount so that I can keep making these free informative videos for you all. So if you're able to do that, I would super appreciate it. If not, that's okay too. Either way, I hope you have a good day and happy foraging. Thank you.